I'm Matt Welch of Reason Magazine. Hi, Bob Wright of uh, Blogging Heads. Is that your primary affiliation, only affiliation these days? Uh, New America Foundation is an affiliation, and, I, and I'm on the masthead of a couple of magazines on those occasions when they actually print mastheads, which they don't do as much anymore because uh, the magazines can't afford paper anymore. Yeah, mastheads are very tricky. Uh, I, yeah. I'm still in the process of uh, trying to purge our own masthead, mostly in references to me. Um, but uh, uh, it's a, <laughs> well, I'm in favor of that. If, uh, if, if, if it we helps. lost our we lost our founder, Reason's uh, founder, Lanny Friedland, a forgotten man, the Sid Barrett of Libertarianism uh, died last week. I think we just heard uh, heard news of it. It's a great sadness for our universe. The guy was a great uh, designer, hmm. very visionary, very uh, sort of late '60s, early '70s. Just to start right away with the death, um, get that over the way. Oh, 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 oh. Well, there we'll be discussing more deaths. So we <laughs> might as well get started uh, now. What? what uh, so when was Reason founded? 1968 in May, like all good revolutions, uh, as you can imagine. It's been. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember those it's days. It's been uh, monthly uh, from its inception, or eleven times a year. Uh, the first mm -hmm. issue, which was mimeographed and lashed together with horses' teeth, um, promised logic and not leg legends, and you know coherence and and uh, truth and not fiction. Um, the guy who started it was a big objectivist, big uh, Ayn Rand fan, uh, who was sort of objectively pro science, and he really hated. Uh, two things above all, which were cops and uh, hippies. <laughs> so he, had a, he hated hippies? Yeah, there's a great, uh, I even probably have it in this room. I'm, I'm saving this from our library where we have uh, most of the back issues. But there's a classic uh, early, uh, I think, 69 uh, edition where there's a line drawing. And it's a half hippie and a half cop. And the, sort of the, uh, the cop has his truncheon raised and the hippies doing the peace sign. And it uh, asks the immortal question of, uh, you know, who's the real pig? Um, so, he would, but who, but hippies embody a certain amount of libertarianism, do they, they not? Do, they, 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 they smoke dope. They, they totally know? do. Uh, There's I to uh, long before I ever uh, either described myself as libertarian or allowed other people uh, to do that without uh, you know facing reprimand. Uh, my high school English thesis paper was entitled "The Martian and the Hippies," and it was about Robert A. Heinlein's "Stranger in a Strange Land." Uh, which is his most famous novel, science fiction, hard-headed mm -hmm. science fiction writer. Um, and uh, it introduced all kinds of wacky themes of religion and free love. And my, uh, my piece was about how uh, they came out in, in the early 60s, I think 61. It was used as a like how-to tract by like the Diggers and other people in the Summer of Love in uh, San Francisco. So it actually played a role both as a predictor and kind of an embracer of utopian free love uh, communities, which is more than you ever thought that you wanted to know about the uh, subject. And there is there is definitely some overlap there. It's a strange, strange uh, little moments. I mean, the SDS had overlap with libertarians back in the 60s, and there was some uh, there was some discussion of political uh, uh, coalitions evolving from that overshared outrage about the war, the military draft, and other things. So. Libertarianism is hmm. not duck. It do doesn't uh, doesn't quack like just about anything else. It doesn't. <clears throat> it doesn't. <laughs> uh, although, it, although it's making more mainstream quacking noises lately, it seems to me. I mean, yeah, you know, there's, there's liberal libertarians. I mean, all of you, all of you guys, it seems to me, you, you libertarians are I have been trying to sound like moderates for several years now, and I just want you to know that I, for one, am not fooled. I, uh, I'm I'm glad that there are still some real skeptics out there in the uh, in the world. No, it's a it's a, a, a phenomenal. Uh, it's very interesting for us to watch. Uh, whereas reason was out there along with, you know, maybe the nation and a few other places as just pretty consistently an anti-Bush publication during his presidency um, because we don't like big spending and big governments and big war mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff uh, and surveillance and, uh, and yeah, anti-civil liberties things. Uh, and so we made a lot of new friends uh, during that period. And then uh, now that uh, there's a different government in town, I was just, I saw on the internet somewhere that uh, Matt Welch just turned the magazine into a, a Republican light or something, which uh, which as someone who wrote a book, uh, you know, condemning John McCain uh, and uh, in 2007 uh, makes me smile. Whoever is in uh, the party in power thinks that we are, you know, dangerous. Coke-funded radicals uh, who need to be stopped, and, and the only part of that that's true is Coke-funded, right? Thank you, thank um, you, and uh, <laughs> dangerous, but mostly to only to ourselves. Yeah. Um, 
not at all dangerous so long as we continue to exclude you from actual power. That's true, uh, which uh, should last a good while longer, although it's, it is unnerving on occasion. I was just talking about this with my boss the other day, I know, but I'm not spilling anything, but uh, to uh, talk to a guy like Rand Paul, who we interviewed uh, uh, about 10 days ago, it's just very uh, strange and almost unsettling when you see like a Republican talking about cutting defense spending and why the Patriot Act is terrible uh, on civil liberties and these kinds of things. And just to remind yourself, wait, I agree, you know, 85% with somebody here who actually seems to have hold political office. It's very, you don't really know what to do with that information. It, it feels like. That's one of the warning yes. signs, you know. That's one of the That's warning practical. signs. Um, but, but, but by and large, this part of libertarianism, the, the, you know, cut defense spending part, has not infiltrated the, what is being called the Tea Party. Am I correct? By and large. Uh, that's, a, that's a great open question. Uh, I just finished writing what's going to be a, our cover story in the June issue and talks about this. Uh, Rand Paul's book, which is an interesting document, and, he's, and he, I think, has exceeded, um, from a libertarian point of view, uh, he's exceeded expectations by quite a lot. There are people saying, oh, he's just a libertarian in name only, and that he's going to sell out his father and all this stuff. Um, he's been pretty radical. He came in day one, said we need to cut defense Republicans, and you're not serious unless you're going to talk about that. Uh, and he has really kind of moved things down uh, uh, in terms of uh, we've got to cut $4 trillion. You know, uh, $61 billion isn't going to do it. Uh, and all this. In his book, he keeps portraying the Tea Party movement as being so strenuously anti-big government, so fixated and focused on the deficit, that by definition, it is going to be hostile to neoconservatism. And he states and he asserts it, and it's really the only part of his book um, that I thought ringed a little bit more wishful thinking than actual truth. I think it is true, mm -hmm. and if you look at, at Documents that have emanated from the Tea Party, like uh, the contract from America, I believe that it's called, uh, which is pretty interesting. And it's, it's a very simple uh, ten points, and it's certainly a lot more inspiring than whatever contract with America that the Republicans were vomiting on us uh, in uh, September of last year. Uh, but it focuses like a laser beam on spending and deficit. I mean, there's very, very little to be said about social issues. Almost nothing on national defense, as far as I remember. So the emphasis has been very uh, focused, even if the people who were involved in it might be much more socially conservative than certainly I ever could be, uh, and also be more kind of a, a, a nationalistic type of defense or more assertive internationally. Mm -hmm. And so I think that Rand Paul, who, who uh, has a legitimate claim on being kind of the first and most important Tea Party senator out there, he is trying to engage with them in such a way that they end up in a more Ron Paul direction, uh, but uh, I don't think that's where they're starting from. So it's uh, right now with Libby and other things like that, these become real tests. And I think the best thing that the Tea Party has done has, has been, uh, in some senses, for its own sense of self-preservation, has been to sit out those fights, not get bogged down in social issues and you know arguing over immigration and stuff, and focusing on the size of government, and then it's a real super open question, I think, on whether they're going to take those insights and say, hey, look, we can't afford these military entanglements and foreign policy entanglements. Mm -hmm. But enough well, about me, say Bob, that, for crying out loud. If, enough about you, but you did mention Libya, which, um, in contrast to you, I am interested in. Um, no, I kid, Matt, I kid. I'm very interested in you and in libertarianism. But uh, I'm also interested in Libya, which you which you wanted to talk about, and I want to talk about. Well, what did you think of the um, uh, What did you think of the speech last night? Well, I didn't think it was bad, actually. I, I mean, my my view of the the intervention has been that you know I wouldn't say I was a full throated supporter, but it's been that it was defensible, and I've done some defending of it. Although I've got to say, it may now be. V evolving in a direction that will leave me um, no longer defending it for reasons I can explain. But let me, let, me, let me actually say some things about the speech and even kind of the intervention that I would think in a way should appeal to a libertarian and, and see where you disagree, which I think will be everywhere. Yeah, um, the, uh, but, you know, as a, you know, as a fiscal conservative... I would think you, you would like uh, the idea of our reducing our commitment to military expenditure and military involvement in the long run. And I think you could see the way this was played 
as a possibly useful step in that direction, right? In other words, this time, in contrast to, to uh, Bush's invasion of Iraq, and of course there are plenty of contrasts. I mean, this isn't, it's not, you know, uh, it's not boots on the ground. It's not, uh, you know, in scale and everything. It, it's, it's, very, it's very different, and I also think in, in, in justification it's very different. But, but the difference I want to I focus on is the way we kind of said, well, look, if it has the literal and formal support of the international community, that is to say Security Council resolution, as well as the endorsement of the locally relevant regional organization. However pleading. Uh, yeah. What, what However that? pleading well, it may be, yes. Uh, possibly. I mean, apparently, well, well yeah, uh, a little, little fluid there, yes. Um, but in, in, in any event, um, and, and if other... Uh, other coalition members really play a meaningful role, so that we so that we can play a, a, a uh, uh, you know a lower profile one and a less costly one. You know, um, I think all of that is is kind of useful precedent if the United States, uh, you know, if you grant that yes, a, a certain kinds of global policing have to be done. But if you like me think that the United States should not be the one who continues to do. Uh, virtually alone, that which does need to be done, right? I don't think we need to be the ones who forever have aircraft carriers all over the place and are doing the interventions. And yet that's so, exactly what we are this time. I mean, I get your point that, it's a, that it is an order of magnitude less in terms of expenditure, less in terms of risk, and these kinds of things. But No, but that's not my main yeah. point, Matt. My main point is that Obama was explicit, and it, we'll leave that aside, he was explicit in his speech last night in saying, he even used the phrase collective action. Uh, and, you know, I, I, uh, I actually, my final, my, my farewell little uh, column for the New York Times, I wrote a year of online uh, columns for the New York Times, I talked about defense as a collective action problem, and, and 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 argued that we should be, you know, the burden should be shared much more than it's been shared. Well, he did focus on that and pick up on that. He even used the term collective action, recognized it's a collective action problem, and said, look, yes, we may act unilaterally when our crew, our vital interests are are at stake, but there's a whole host of other problems that are kind of everybody's problem or more one region's problems than ours, and we are not going to, be the world's policeman. And that is different from the vibe you got from the, the Bush administration. That's the part I'm talking about. This as a step toward a truly collective approach, uh, and therefore a cheaper approach uh, in, in a couple of senses uh, for the United States, a truly collective approach to policing the world. Uh, I'm, That's I'm I mean. glad that you used the word vibe, because I think that in trying to weave a uh, a uh, kind of coherence, a uh, collection of differences between liberal interventionism or uh, uh, sort of humanitarian interventionism and that of the neo more neoconservative variety, um, you're kind of left with a lot of vibing. It's, uh, you know, I, I once said, and I hope that uh, this is going to get me kicked off of Blogging Heads uh, TV forever, or at least off the front page of the New York Times, but... Consider it done, uh, man. Thank you. Consider it done. I, mean, I have a lot of power. Uh, that, uh, you know, the difference between Wilsonianism and neoconservatism is that neoconservatism is the same stuff, but with a Fuck France t-shirt on, uh, basically, <laughs> and, uh, and, and although that's glib and there are some other real differences, ultimately you're talking about the same level, I think, of uh, promiscuity in terms of what is your threshold, what is your bar for intervening somewhere. The difference in vibe is that Democrats are going to uh, uh, embrace and emphasize the multilateralismness of it. We're going to build some kind of mm -hmm. consensus on the on the UN. Uh, we're going to do this and that. We're probably going to be even less uh, deferential to Congress, uh, which I think is problematic for a lot of reasons. Uh, and so it's going to feel like more of a, and we're going to be much less committed to having boots on the ground. So it's going to be cheaper in terms of our human lives and of our money. But at the same time, we are still, you can say as much as you want, hey, international community, it's not going to be us every time, just, you know, this time um, and the time before and the time before that. We are still going in that direction, and I would argue we're even further in that direction. There isn't much hesitation anymore. Um, the, the doctrine that we saw last night, which I think is is very, very radical doctrine that uh, Obama laid down is that we are not, he refused to see 
photos of mass graves. He refused to allow an atrocity, a massacre, to happen. Uh, that was his language. Um, now, you know, there will be atrocities and massacres that will happen that he will not prevent um, just because there won't be as much opportunistic uh, ways to stop it. There's not going to be as much of a consensus internationally. But that is the, the clear standard that he set last night, which is kind of the Potter Stewart pornography definition. Now, I know it when I see it. I know it when it's too much for me to bear. Uh, that we can't handle the headlines, and then we will intervene, or at least that'll be enough reason for us to intervene if we can convince enough people. Well, I am very sorry for all of my friends who believed for a moment that they were voting for an anti-war candidate, even though he didn't really campaign that way. Um, that is not an anti-war message. That is a message that reinforces America's centrality to every debate in the world. It also lowers the bar for the next Republican president. I mean, there's a reason why Bill well, well, Crystal wait, no, wait, was no, no, That's where I differ. That's where I differ. That's where I differ. That, I, I, and, and I want to, I mean, let's, let's put aside the humanitarian grounds for intervention. That, that, that doesn't speak to the point I'm trying to make here, and we should talk about that, because I'm not that big on promiscuous humanitarian intervention myself. And, and if this didn't have, uh, you know, complementary rationales to that, that of a more realist nature, uh, I would, I would uh, be, you know, totally unsympathetic to it. Because I don't think the humanitarian stakes were large by historical kind of standards. But what I want to emphasize, I'm, I'm, I'm not just saying, uh, well, we're going to do it a little more multilaterally. I'm saying what the difference between Obama here and Bush in Iraq, uh, among many other differences, is we said, let's try to get this through the Security Council. Bush said the same thing, okay? But Bush said, oh, you can't get Security Council approval? Well, then we'll just do it ourselves. Obama, is said, he said in his speech last night, pretty explicitly, if we hadn't gotten the Security Council approval, and probably if we hadn't had Arab League support, we would not have done it. That's the difference I'm focusing on. So you just brought up Bill Crystal and said, Bill Crystal can use this as a precedent for X, Y, and Z, and of course he'd love to use it now as a precedent for intervening in Syria. And what I want to emphasize is, no. You know, what we said is, uh, if you, you know, if you don't get Security Council authorization, if it doesn't have the support of the, of the relevant regional uh, organization, um, you know, don't even think about it. If that is the policy, that's not going to get Bill Crystal into Syria. He's not going to. He's not going to allow him to get us into Syria. But it could. So I want to. I want. I want to just, just for a second, put aside the question of humanitarian versus realist rationale, magnitude of the conflict, grounds for intervening, and focus on this formal difference, which is the one thing that really appealed to me about the way we proceed. But at the same time, which is we, we took international law and, and the mechanisms for enforcing international law seriously, and we said they are a litmus test. If you can't get formal authorization, it ain't going to happen. You took that too far. You took that too far, difference. Bob, because there's, he also said, I assert the right, and when he did this on the campaign trail, too, to act militarily unilaterally. He even said the phrase, uh, if uh, if need be, or if it's deemed in our interest to do so, I reserve the right to act unilaterally. So it's not a we will not go there ever. It is that in this sort of, if a situation looks like this, we're going to want to make sure that everyone agrees. But the thing is, the next situation is going to be a different president, a different party. It's going to look a little bit different. I mean, Kosovo helped pave the way for Iraq, and I don't understand mm -hmm. how people don't see that. We were talking about intervening into yeah. what is basically a, you know, a civil war, a, fra a country fracturing uh, yeah. here and, and violating in some ways notions of sovereignty that had obtained previously. And Kosovo didn't, there yeah. wasn't any real rationale in, or, or even the trumped up rationale about, oh, they could come back and, you know, uh, kill us in our, where we live. And that kind of, there wasn't any 9-11 hanging over it. Um, you know, there yeah. was in Iraq, and no, and, and I wasn't, and I didn't, I didn't endorse endorse the coast of the intervention, largely because we didn't get Security Council authorization. Um, and I agree with you that in that sense, it didn't just pave the way for Iraq. By the way, it, it paved the way for Russia to invade Georgia. But but leave that aside. No, you're right. Um, That's a great point. The the, the uh, um, so look, I I think I'm almost alone in this whole thing in putting a tremendous amount of emphasis on the formal mechanisms of authorization. I mean, I remember when people started saying, "Well, should we intervene? Should we intervene?" I, I thought that to me that is not the question at all. The question is, is by what mechanism of justification? I, you know, and and in fact, I said 
uh, you know, to Mickey Kaus, your your uh, your friend Mickey Kaus, and my friend even, um, at the very beginning of this, back when uh, a more modest form of uh, intervention uh, would have would have uh, would have prevented uh, you know uh, towns like Benghazi from even coming under threat, I said to Mickey, I just think you know if he, if he wants to do it, go to the Security Council and say. We want to do this, and if the Security Council says no, okay, you don't do it. I honestly thought at that point the Security Council would say no, and that that would have been a useful precedent. Um, but uh, I think that there are some know. people who who uh, agree with that approach, or at least there's a decent overlap within the Obama administration itself. If you look at people who are clearly at this point have his ear more than others, and I'm thinking very specifically of Samantha Power uh, here. She places a lot yeah. of emphasis. And, hey, look, there's a qualitative difference here. We are housing, you know, all these rationales within the structures of the U.N. We're doing that in a way that is quicker than we were able to do in Bosnia, in part by uh, adopting the lessons of Bosnia. And that gives it both a greater international legitimacy and it builds the instrument or the muscles for next time that we need to do something like that. I get all that. Um, but I think that she in particular uh, and those who are uh, in favor of this uh, action are naive about what happens next time when it's not up to them or even what happens next time in their own brains. I mean, I, I think the standard that was elucidated last night is, is really impossible to define. What, what, at what point are we going to decide that what Bahrain's doing to its citizens is, is beyond the pale and it's too much? Uh, well, well, no, no, Matt. I, again, I think last night did the opposite. I, I, I think for the purposes of this set of problems in the Arab world, like should we intervene in, in Syria, for example, to take the extreme case of what the neocons would like, the fact that we got Security Council authorization and Arab League support and the subsequent articulation of what he articulated last night makes it very easy to, to say to Bill, Bill Crystal, no way. And so it, it isn't just that, as Samantha Power apparently said, this strengthens our muscles for next time. It also gives us uh, grounds for not intervening next time if we don't have the thoroughgoing support uh, of the international community. You know, that's what I like about it, is that it actually sets a high bar for intervention in a formal sense. I've Security Council authorization, support of the local uh, organization. So, so, you know, that, that's, uh, I mean, I mean, you know, so so, so I, I agree with you that on the on the in terms of the the the, the criterion for you you know the, the situation on the ground in Libya, um, the the you know was this uh, in terms of how low this sets the bar for sheerly humanitarian intervention? I'm a little uncomfortable, but the, how high it sets the bar in terms of formal mechanisms that have to be engaged. I like that. Okay, so you know, that's, we have, that's we have how many countries in the Arab Spring now that are undergoing tumult? Is it 18? It's 20? It's some, something like that. Uh, it's a huge number. About all of them. Uh, pretty much, pretty yeah. much all of them. I mean, it's a, it's a, you know, we are uh, blessed enough to uh, live through interesting times, and and uh, you know, I have I have great optimistic hopes that on balance it's going to turn out well, and I've been very moved by a lot of uh, a lot of the action over there. Uh, which is precisely why I'm nervous about America getting involved and putting its thumb on the scales, because then it, it becomes more of a story about America. And I think we saw that last night in Obama's speech. I mean, there were some really awkward formulations. Is like, and then I made it clear that Gaddafi had lost the <laughs> lost the respect of his people. It's like that's not that's actually not your call, uh, you know, to, yeah. to make that particular thing clear. And and so I mean, I hope that those stories, uh, by and large, remain. Uh, Libya notwithstanding, remain to be uh, stories about the people themselves, so that they can own their own revolutions for good and for bad, and that we are, aren't warping the entire playing field uh, by getting in there. But to get to your sort of questions, which why I brought up this way, is that, I mean, everything there is changing so fast. No one could have predicted three months ago we'd be having this conversation, for the most part. Um, so mm -hmm. I can easily foresee, uh, without knowing which one it would be, but that another you know, horrifying dictator there would suddenly look like that he's on the run. I mean, there were a few days where, you know, Qaddafi was losing all of his ambassadors, and it really felt like it's a matter of hours. And so, you know, everyone turns on him, and then the Arab League says, okay, he's, a, he's yesterday's man. Uh, I can foresee a situation where you have the same argument and the same people 
flipping and say he's got to go too. So let's have. And actually, I don't, I don't think I don't think you can foresee many of those because in most of the cases, the dictator is one of our guys. And if anything, the temptation in Iran, in Saudi Arabia, in Yemen is going to be to step in on his behalf, which I don't think would be good. And and in fact, another thing I kind of like about the Libya policy is that is that our intervention in Libya makes it harder for us to for us to even give full-throated rhetorical support to dictators that 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 who are our guys and want to hang on now the exceptions are things like are relatively few but they're things like Syria in the Arab world or Iran outside of the Arab world where the neocons are going to be trying uh, to use uh, Libya as a precedent for reasons I've articulated I think they'll uh, it, it should be easy to make them fail uh, not not to mention just pointing to the realistic facts of how much more tremendously explosive it would be to intervene in, Sur in Syria and how totally nuts you'd have to be to do it. Um, uh, but, but I think there really aren't that many... Ca I mean, w w I'm trying to I, think. I, I think I the, biggest, the, the biggest uh, potential you know, uh, recipients of, of, uh, of uh, the, the next uh, burst of uh, interventionist enthusiasm is, is Iran? Um, you know, I, you have an right. international Iran Syria. You, you have an, an international uh, community, France in particular, who is super. Uh, you know, uh, 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 hawkish is the wrong word, but very keyed into what's happening in Tehran in some way. I, I think we've lowered the bar into going into war against Iran. Period. I don't. I don't see how that's not the case. Even if you stress multilateral institutions, and you know, Iran's only a couple of really bad sneezes away from alienating those two, uh, and and that is a recipe for, I think, some pretty serious instability. Uh, going I mean, there's going to be instability no matter what. Uh, it's just a question of, of uh, how much of it is going to be us taking responsibility for the world's affairs at a time when we just can't afford it, uh, like physically. We don't have the money. Uh, and I think that that would also retard the development of people. Well, I, I would, of course, oppose that intervention in Iran and Syria. I don't think there's any way you'd get past that past the Security Council, especially now that we are showing signs of exceeding the authority. And, and now we get to the part where this policy is beginning to move in a direction where I'm not willing to defend it. We are, we are now showing signs of exceeding the mandate of the Security Council, and the Russians have complained about this. I don't see any way Russia signs off on another one of these. Uh, and, and, in fact, um, Today, I guess, I mean, this, this happened right before we got on, so I don't have the details, but there was a meeting of, I guess, well, a lot of the, co a lot or, or all the coalition members who, who, who now formally have uh, asserted that, uh, well, or, or clearly, explicitly asserted that, um, that, that getting, getting uh, Gaddafi out of power is, is a goal. Well, if they want to make that their goal, uh, I mean, various nations can choose to make that their goal. If they're going to pretend that that comes under the, the U.N. mandate, then they are just abusing the United Nations and destroying anything good that I, that I just claimed has come out of this. And, and, and that they will have done, if Obama does not stay arguably within bounds of the U.N. security mandate when he purports to be acting in its name, he will be doing as much damage to the U.N. and the international system as Bush did uh, with the Iraq War, or at least close but to I mean, that. Isn't, and, and so, isn't it, uh, it's just fundamental there. I mean, last night he did it again and again and said, hey, look, we can't have it as part of the military uh, mandate because that's, you know, that, that would uh, uh, cause the Bob Wright problem. But meanwhile, we uh, support it as a country. Well, you know what? We're not an insignificant country in this action. Yeah. Um, can, well, you really, think, yeah. can you really have that dual track? Does that even make sense? Uh, well, in a strictly technical sense, it does. I mean, I think it was a mistake for him to ever say Gaddafi must go. It makes me so sick when American presidents act as if they rule the world and, and at the flick of a finger, you know, uh, can decide which rulers stay and, and which go. But and I think it was truth. just tactically that's, stupid. That, that is the world that, in a sense, you are supporting by supporting the action. I mean, you, you get there. That, well, no, that... no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I'm saying, no, if you don't get Security Council uh, authority, no, I don't want you going and, and trying to. And he would not have gotten Security Council authority for that. That's my view. Now, and, and my view in general, about uh, you know, the other thing they're talking about is arming the rebels. If they're going to pretend that comes under the Security Council mandate, they're nuts, because the mandate was to protect civilians. And the rebels, now that they've regained uh, their homeland, 
uh, will be killing civilians themselves with any weapons they can get their hands on. Yeah. You know, as they as they move in on Sirte, which is a which is a city that has true Gaddafi support. Um, I, I I think so. I don't support that. And my view is, look. If France wants to arm the rebels, Sarko if Sarkozy wants to be the hero of this thing, fine, let him. If France wants to say, it is our national policy, uh, you know, we have already formally recognized the rebels as the true representatives of Libya, we're going to sell them some weapons for zero dollars, you know, fine if you want to do that. Do not pretend that this comes under UN, UN authority. And do not, uh, I, uh, as an American citizen, I'd say do not get us mixed up in it. I am uh, ma married to a uh, French woman, and uh, I just... Uh I realize and I respect your ideas about sort of subsuming uh, or, or uh, embracing the multilateral uh, approach to all of this uh, uh, action. And that said, there is something fundamental about having a, a act of U.S. war that is at least in some way uh, connected with Bar Bernard Henri Levy, uh, you know, uh, twisting uh, Sarkozy's arm. It just feels odd. It just it's awkward. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I this is not a place that I imagined myself or my country to ever really be in. And uh, and uh, well, under Obama, anyway. Uh, yeah, I. Um... I mean, let's talk about that. I find that interesting. I, I wrote a post the other day about the anti-war lesson for Tea Parties, and it's not, as you might suspect, a uh, a look at uh, their own sense of intervention interventionism or not, but rather allegiance. Um, I think it's. I think this action, speech, and just kind of contemporary American politics, has shown. I think demonstrated without uh, any real doubt that there is no such thing as a professionally effective anti-war Democrat. That 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 mm -hmm. train done be gone. And uh, and part of the reason is that the anti-war enthusiasm. Uh, was almost fully integrated and domesticated within the Democratic Party, beginning with naming Howard Dean chair of the party in 2005. That enthusiasm went there. It went towards uh, Barack Obama. Uh, there's, I was just uh, linking, a, linking a paper yesterday written uh, that just sort of talked very explicitly the extent to which the anti-war movement was kind of a subset of uh, the Democratic Party movement. And as soon as they became successful, particularly in the 2006 elections, it just kind of dissipated. And for me, the lesson for Tea Partiers out there is don't become domesticated on the Republican Party tent because that's exactly what will happen to you. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a shame because I think regardless of where, you you know, even if you're a, a John McCain interventionist or, or not, um, you know, we have a venerable tradition of, of anti-interventionism on this country in both parties. Uh, I think more on the left mm -hmm. than in the right, but sort of the Kucinich left and the, and the Ron Paul right, let's say. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that tradition has been you know, flouted by both major parties now for so long, it's hard to even remember what the world looked like beforehand. And, mm -hmm. and my uh, theory that we explore, Nick Gillespie and I, in our uh, forthcoming book, The Declaration of Independence for the TS, um, is precisely that, that when you hold yourself as a block of voters that is independent out there, that uh, believe, that hews uh, to principle more than team membership, that it increases your potency. And I mean, just as we see now, there is no real potency on the anti-war left. And so I'm curious what you have to say about that. That there's no potency on the anti-war yeah. left. Um, I, 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 I see a lot of progressives out there who are opposed to this intervention, or at least highly skeptical of it. Um, I mean, it's an interesting question how the coalition in support of this compares to the Iraq coalition. You have a fair number of liberal humanitarian hawks on board for this, and Marie Slaughter. You have uh, you have a few who weren't. It's true, uh, Nick Kristoff, uh, Juan Cole. Um, I am, you know, again defending defending it in a certain sense, and I was uh, very very uh, in a high volume way against Iraq uh, from the get go. So there there are there are people who, um, and, and I think I, I think. Uh, for largely intelligible reasons. I mean, there, there are a million differences between Iraq and this, including the mechanism ju of justification uh, of formal authorization, which is important to me, um, and the fact that there was, although the humanitarian stakes weren't huge, I think they're, they're higher in a real-time sense than in Iraq. Yes, yes, Hussein had done terrible things, but he wasn't killing people at the rate that Gaddafi was when, when we intervened uh, at that point. So I, I think... 
it's uh, it's kind of understandable that uh, this is, I guess, picked up a few supporters on uh, the left. Uh, although at the same time, there are there are people who progressives who who at least during the invasion supported Iraq, and I think don't support this. I don't think Matt Iglesias, is, for example, is, is enthusiastic about this. So, I think there's a whole generation yeah, I, of uh, liberal hawks who basically felt pretty silent on <laughs> on foreign affairs there for a couple of years, and they came out the other mm-hmm. side pretty chastened, and uh, and in general don't right. don't uh, don't talk right. about it. Right. In fact, it's interesting that 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 some of the uh, the 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 really uh, full-throated supporters of this on the left are people who were unequivocally against Iraq and kind of don't don't feel that they need to to establish their their credentials, right. you know, Juan Cole, uh, so on. Um, and then so so then on the right, how are you saying? How are you seeing the the coalition? Uh, well, I, I mean, with with the important caveat that uh, you know, uh, uh, me speaking for the right is a, is a disaster for everybody involved. Uh, you know, I think uh, I saw. I think I saw Lindsey Graham express skepticism somewhere about intervening uh, in, in this process. Maybe it wouldn't surprise no, me. No, it surprises me. He's been he's been McCain's right hand man. Uh, you know, he and uh, with, along with Joe Lieberman, they've been very three musketeerish about uh, a yeah. very robust uh, interventionism uh, abroad. I think he he got back on the uh, on the uh, reservation pretty quickly after that. But there was a momentary skepticism. I saw Charles Krauthammer. Uh, who has not exactly been a shrinking Yeah, but that's just because he can't, I think he can't bring himself to say something nice about uh, Obama. And, and of course, on both sides, this is not irrelevant in terms of progressives who are now on board for the first time and conservatives who aren't. It's not irrelevant that now it's a Democratic president. No, I mean, the the sick thing (laughs) in uh, American politics is that that is more relevant than just about anything. I mean, there's... Uh, a, uh, a, a poll from Pew, I think, from last fall that uh, Ross, Ross Doubt had, or however you pronounce his name. Uh, Doubt it, I think. And, and he's an example of somebody who um, supported Iraq at the time, at least, but was chastened fairly early and is quite opposed to this. He's been writing very, very well at this, uh, on this subject, and I say that as someone who's criticized him in public in the past, so I want to tip my hat. I think he's been very thoughtful. Uh, and pretty thorough about about this. I mean, you have a lot, I think you have a lot of George Will conservatives. He's been skeptical mm-hmm. about Iraq and Afghanistan for a while now, and now he's just sort of permanently soured on on the kind of nation building uh, exercises there. So, I mean, in general, right. the the anti the Robert Taft kind of uh, uh, version of republicanism mm-hmm. is has been more ascendant, and there have been people who feel like they've been. You know, they've been chastened uh, by uh, the war over time. But the real sick thing is that, uh, as uh, as, uh, Ross uh, was pointing out, like if you asked Republicans in 2004 uh, or so, like, uh, is the government a direct threat to you, yes or no? And, you know, 63% said no and 20% said yes. And if you ask Democrats the same question the same year, the numbers were exactly reversed. 63% said yes and 20% mm-hmm. no. And then fast forward six years later, and those numbers are exactly reversed. I mean, it's it, people's, mm-hmm. people's outlook on this, uh, it, they pretend to, to hew to some kind of, of rational means-tested kind of line. But uh, at the end of the day, so much of it is that I trust my guy in, in doing his mm-hmm. war feels right to me, and I don't trust the other guys when they do it. Mm-hmm. And my message to those people, besides go to hell, all of you, and get off my lawn, is that just imagine that the people that you hate even more than I hate, because that's your job to hate them, uh, is uh, uh, they have power next time. Uh, what, what do they have now? What tool did you give them in this process? Mm-hmm. And my big fear about all this stuff is that the tools just always get a little bit bigger. We get more and more involved in the world, even if we talk more about getting less involved in the world. It just it all flows in that direction, and it becomes easier. And so now, like, sovereignty yeah. is just a sort of a minor hiccup to overcome, where 15 years ago, when you talked about that intellectually in the pages of foreign affairs and foreign policy, that was a big deal. Now we don't even talk about it. So, I, you know. You're, you're talking about Libya, Libya sovereignty. Any, any crap sovereignty, is sovereignty is yes. Uh, right. You know, I mean, that, that was seen as a pretty strong barrier to getting involved in, in a country. Uh, well, you yeah. know, we can't, when they invade another country, then, okay, we can muster an international coalition. It becomes a little bit easier to figure out what to do. Uh, but, you know, now 
anybody can be analogized to Hitler. I was on TV last night talking about this in Fox Business. There's Ralph Peters, you know, saying, well, Gaddafi, yeah, he's just like Hitler. And I just felt like jumping through the screen. No, not again. Are we really going to do this yeah. every time? And that's what I, that's yeah. what I fear, that we're going to do this every time. Amen. Yeah. Okay. Well, where um, do you have any thoughts on where you think this is actually going to go from here? I mean, on the ground, it's it's a quite dicey situation at the moment. I mean, w w it's almost a point uh, approaching a point of natural equilibrium in the sense that the rebels have regained the ground that they lost. They they kind of, you know, the, 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 at the moment at least, the border uh, seems to be between the places where the rebels have most support, except that there are a couple of cities like Miserata where. Uh, Gaddafi is, is, which I think are unsympathetic to Gaddafi, and uh, and he's uh, continues to brutalize them. Um, but but in other words, you're at a point where you can start to imagine a kind of a partition type solution. But apparently now everyone uh, in the coalition is on record as saying that won't be enough. And interestingly, uh, Qatar, you know, the uh, one of the two uh, Arab countries is actually providing material support to the coalition. They've actually flown jets in, uh, flown jets over Libya. They are apparently very vehement about saying Gaddafi's got to go. So, I guess uh, partition is not is not in the cards. Yeah, uh, it sounds like. I mean, and, and Libya is is you know more religiously homogenous than most uh, states are in the Middle East and North not, Africa. So it's not. Yeah, it's not sectarian. There are tribal differences, but I'm told they're really not that strong at the end of the day compared to a sectarian difference like so, I mean, you know, Sunni Shia. You know about this more than I do, clearly, but uh, you know, the, we have built it up so that a stalemate seems logical from just uh, how things might proceed. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I presume that the hope is that the stalemate is, acts as a siege somehow on, on yeah. Gaddafi, that the international community hates his guts and wants to see him leave, even though they might quibble over the uh, exact mechanisms for how that happens. I think he's going to be, off, mm -hmm. be offered a series of, you know, exile deals over and over again to try to lure him out uh, quickly. I'm sure the Obama administration is putting a lot of pressure to make things happen quickly because, uh, you know, it's a nightmare scenario if you have like a Kosovo duration of a 78-day bombing campaign and this kind of equilibrium. I, the, you know, the coalition is fracturing as it is. It's not popular in America. It's not unpopular yet, but it can easily get that way. Uh, so they need a, a speedy resolution. And on paper, and just watching this kind of third way, back and forth, thread in the needle stuff from Obama last night, it just really feels like there's not a lot of margin in there for what can happen. So uh, you know, I... I presume somehow, and I don't know why, that, the, that there's a plan lurking in what looks uh, on all appearances to not really be one. Uh, and, and, and events are moving so fast there that I think uh, in the broader Middle East, it's just very, uh, it's very difficult to figure out what goes, what goes next. But, uh, you know, I hope it's not a, a, a three-month, a six-month, a 12-month stalemate and, and that somehow, uh, you know, all this folly, which I have opposed uh, every second of, you know, turns out for the best, uh, and you know, peace and freedom, uh, you know, uh, carries the day. But uh, I'm pretty skeptical. Well, I think one thing. I mean, Obama, in terms of domestic political support, he doesn't have to worry about losing a lot of American lives or anything. I, I don't, we're not going to put boots on the ground. But uh, I, I think uh, the a thing that the coalition has to worry about is the rebels. You know, if the rebels do want to take uh, Gaddafi's hometown and, and go into Tripoli, I don't see it happening without killing a certain number of civilians. And and I think that's one thing the whole coalition has to worry about in terms of public relations, is if they are giving some sort of um, any any sort of uh, tactical support to rebels that are killing civilians, they got a lot of explaining to do, given what the actual UN Security Council resolution said. And I think that, I think um, what we've seen, uh, if we can draw lessons from. Uh, you know, post-communist Eastern Europe, where I lived for a long time, uh, and I don't think that you can draw too many lessons, but there's some. Uh, one of them just is the more totalitarian and just screwed up and cult of personality and uh, secret police yeah. a place was, the more damaged uh, that it was going to be in the transition. I mean, I think Libya, yeah. uh, there's a lot of screwed up countries in that region. Uh, Saudi Arabia, when that thing comes unraveled, oh my God. You know, uh, but Libya is going to be yeah. in a bad way. These are not going to be, you know, uh, uh, Alexandria University 
uh, you know, theologians here that we're talking about necessarily. I mean, I've seen some reporting that uh, puts a nice gloss on some of who these people are, the John Lee Anderson piece in New Yorker. Yeah, that piece was not very alarming, that New Yorker yeah. piece, uh, by and large. And, and I don't think we really know very much, except we know that they do not have a civil society infrastructure that's going to transition to democracy very gracefully. Yeah. I'm told that Yemen actually has a much better chance of that, uh, at least a much more robust civil society infrastructure. <clears throat> so I don't know. It's going to be... Uh, and I think I think Egypt is the yeah. is the uh, is the great hope in all of this, really. And and, uh, and yeah. you know, it's a lot of uh, a lot of disturbing news coming out of Egypt on uh, on how uh, some of the student leaders have been frozen out of the kind of reform uh, process, and there's been renewed crackdowns on protests and things like that. I mean, if there, I, I can't recall rooting for uh, something happening in uh, uh, in a country that's you know we weren't at war with. Uh, as much as I've been rooting for the civil society in Egypt to win, because that's that's the country in the Middle East. That's really the uh, yeah. that is the center of that culture, uh, whatever the, yeah. if that is, uh, how, however defined. And if that goes well, then anything is possible, really. And, and in general, the fact that we're even talking about this in, in 20 different countries uh, shows that a, a, anything is possible. Again, it gives lie to the notion that. Uh, you can have stability and dictatorship go hand in hand. I mean, dictatorships mm -hmm. are stable, stable, stable until uh, the moment that someone sneezes and then the whole thing comes unraveled really quickly. And it's been, mm -hmm. a, I think, a great route of stability junkies. Um, and I think that's is as harrowing as that is and, and, uh, and as scary and on some levels, that it's also pretty thrilling and it's, and it's great and right. genuinely moving to see people kind of recognize rights that nobody in their country mm -hmm. has ever seized or even thought of on some level and then acting in that, in that way. It's a, and, and it's got to happen sooner or later, and the world will be better after we get through it and, and the Arab world has been brought into the democratic world. And, um, and that's one reason I, I kind of hated to see Gaddafi succeed, because it was a less, you know, it sent the message to dictators that, hey, you just, you know, kill a few thousand people and you can get through this. So that was part of where my um, my sympathies on this came from. So is there anything else in the world we should talk about? I mean, the uh, I assume the libertarian takeaway from the Japanese thing is that if only the uh, nuclear reactors had never been subjected to government regulation, they would have done fine. Uh, no, it, no, it's, the libertarian takeaway is that we're all moving to Somalia. Bob. That's, uh, that's what uh, uh, we're hoping for. No, I mean, some of those, uh, it's amazing how resilient uh, on, on some levels some of those reactors have been, considering how old they are, um, and you know, yeah. new line uh, reactors such as they exist in the world, uh, not in the United States really, um, certainly uh, have a, a different notion of safety and all of that. Uh, no, it's, it's been, uh, uh, the one thing that we keep hitting on, uh, Jesse Walker, our managing editor, writes very well about this, um, both in terms of Japan and also in places like New Orleans. It's just bizarre, this, reaction that everyone has, leave aside libertarianism, but just the notion of, uh, you know, isn't it strange that the Japanese aren't panicking, uh, that they're not rioting, they're not looting in their stores. Um, and, uh, and in fact, when you study how people behave in disaster scenarios and catastrophes, natural, man-made, mm -hmm. or whatever, that's the norm. It is actually very, yeah. very rare uh, to, for yeah. people to behave otherwise. People self-organize yeah. in a very interesting way, and, and this is, it's a pattern that replicates everywhere. And the more trust and you know, success that a, a place has, especially in terms of the cops, uh, the more that's going to be the case. And, and it, I think it has implications for how we plan our own uh, you know, disasters and things and how we, we look at something like, a, like a, a New Orleans or our own uh, you know, FEMA planning they tend to be super top-down, uh, let's get the military and National Guard kind of dispensing mm -hmm. things. But actually people uh, from the bottom up tend to make the right decisions in most uh, cases and, and, and uh, tend to keep their heads. And, and I think that's really been the, the case in, in Japan. I, the, the question that I have, and I don't have any kind of answer for it because I'm not uh, very fluent in any of that, but uh, is – to what extent the uh, uh, nuclear uh, companies there were sort of keeping uh, data to themselves or is the government sharing enough information and that kind of stuff. I don't have any real sense of it, but it's, yeah. it's remarkable just watching the YouTube uh, videos of the tsunami in particular that we're not talking about, you know, 500,000 people dead. It's, uh, it's, uh, 
Yeah, it is. Uh, wealth, and, and it is, wealth is good for it is a heartening fact about, about human nature that it isn't only external threats from other human beings, other tribes that lead to this kind of bonding. You're right. It can be an inanimate threat in the form of, of a disaster that seems to have kind of the same galvanizing effect. I mean, I think there's still a case for, you know, having, having supplies at the ready and having people whose job it is to prepare sure. for this stuff. But it, it, is an encouraging, uh, it is an encouraging fact. On the Jap on the Japanese on the nuclear reactors, um, my question still is. I mean, I may start sounding a little like a libertarian here. What, what was what, what was the uh, was the situation ever quite as spooky as we were led to believe? You know, we we had a guy early on in this who happened to be on this show. We have Science Saturday. He's a big nuclear power advocate, and he said, "Look, it's just not going to get that bad. It's like." You know, yes, basically, yes, a bunch of people may have their chances of, of getting cancer infinitesimally raised, yes. But you're not going to, you know, it's not going to be much worse than that. And the reason that was striking at the time was that the news coverage was giving you the impression that there was something horrible that could happen. That, you know, and they didn't quite say it, but you thought, if it happens, millions will die or something, you know. And I still don't know whether... That was really, I'm starting to think, that actually, no, that couldn't have happened. I mean, there was actually a, a limit to how bad the meltdown could be in terms of, of uh, you know, kind of straightforwardly leading to death. I, I don't know the answer to the question, but I'm starting to think the media let us down in just not articulating really what, what were the possible paths that this thing could take in a very clear fashion. Maybe I just didn't read the right pieces or you something. Know, you, uh, you ought to think about maybe having our uh, science correspondent, Ron Bailey, uh, on to do explainer stuff on this. He's written a couple of pieces for us. That, That's a good idea. We've had him on, I think. Yeah, but, uh, but uh, I should, mean, just uh, like talking through it, because uh, we do the same uh -huh. thing. We use him on the table that I'm sitting in here, and just like, hey, Ron, talk us through this new stuff. Um, uh, because and besides, he says, don't worry, it's not a problem. Uh, he doesn't say, no worry, it's not a problem. I mean, anytime you have a number like 100,000 times the you know uh, accepted uh, uh, dose of whatever, that yeah. is problematic. Uh, but, you know, I'm always I'm strangely heartened by all this, and, and I'm obviously in a way filibustering because I don't understand science in general. But um, in the rea in the reaction to uh, both this nuclear thing, the Gulf oil spill of last year, I think it was, uh, um, mm -hmm. big, huge, you know, environmental catastrophe tied with a major energy source. Um, it is strangely comforting to me that, um, for the most part, public opinion shows that people don't really change their opinion that much about the uh, underlying technology. Um, uh, because I think in our public debate, certainly in our journalism, there is this the overwhelming tendency to focus on you know, the three or four major sources of energy out there and just say, hey, look, you know, Three Mile Island is poisoning everybody and the Love Canal is poisoning everybody. Um, and so we have to stop this form. And here's an oil spill and, and here are all these seabirds and in uh, the in Santa Barbara Channel, and then this is terrible. It's very easy to, to paint a story of, like, you know, this source is untenable. It's much more difficult to kind of paint a picture of, hey, you know what, major sources of energy all suck on some level. They're all, there is some, mm -hmm. like, mitigating, there's a, a pollution factor, there's a trade-off built in in every one, uh, and some of them are just so much more cheaper and scalable than all the stuff that we really like, and and, you know, I, I never like to see politicians living in the fantasy land where if you just have enough windmills, we're going to cre create five million new jobs. I mean, they don't help the trade-off argument because they really don't want to have an intelligent conversation. But Americans, at least, and uh, in, in the polls that I've seen, tend to kind of come out from those things thinking uh, kind of hard-headed. Like, yeah, we got to make difficult choices and let's not lose our heads over the moment, uh, which is uh, which is mm -hmm. kind of difficult to uh, difficult to do, and I think it's a challenge for all of us in journalism to figure out how to cover this stuff because on an individual uh, basis, all it takes is one bad nuke thing, and boy, uh, you know that that changes life as we know it. But you know, this is a technology that's been around for 50 years, and we just haven't had that many horrible nuke things happen. Not so far, Not so far. Um, and I really don't know what the, what the truth is, but I'd like to see some great journalism, and it probably exists, and I, I don't know about it, but this all leads naturally to, to Elizabeth Taylor, yes. Matt. Yes. Uh, in closing, just to add a little, a little uh, spice to the, 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 uh, the mix of subjects here, 
Am, am I wrong to think that, that she really wasn't actually all that great? I mean, you know, uh, our Nick Gillespie uh, uh, made uh, made uh, tried to make that point after she died. Uh, you know, I, I'm, that's, a, that's always a bad time to make that's that always, point. Found. You know, um, <laughs> but, the Christopher Hitchens. Uh, I'm ducky here to tie my shoe in case anyone wants to know why they're always in the corner of my head. Um, yeah, you know, she kind of. Um, I'm 42 years old, I think, last time I looked, and so uh-huh. by the time I was old enough to know who Liz Taylor was, it was actually like. Uh, John Belushi and Drag eating a chicken bone on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> so she was already famous for being formerly famous and fat uh, by the time I had any idea who she was. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, the only thing that I ever saw in that, that blew my socks off was uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Uh, yeah, and I'm wondering if that actually yeah. holds up, or that's the kind of thing you watch. Well, I, I, I it. saw it fairly recently. I don't think it's an especially hard part to play, frankly. Yeah. You know, it's a... It's a it, it, it wasn't a subtle spectrum of, of, of emotions, as I recall, that she was, you know, it was like mostly being, you know, alternating between being really sarcastic toward her husband and screaming at him. <clears throat> um, and uh, we all know that both of those things are easy. All, everyone who's married knows that you can, you can do those without being a trained actor. Um, the, uh, my, you know, you mentioned the, the famous for being, I don't know if you use the phrase famous for being famous, but that's a little bit of my theory. I mean, I'm not saying she wasn't, attractive and talented, okay? But I am older than you, so I remember just as I was becoming aware of things in general, like life, you know, like age age five, six, seven, she was the, the one actress I had heard of. But what I had heard was that she had gotten divorced a bunch of times. <laughs> and and what, what I think is that she was one of the first examples of something that's very common right now is that people become famous largely uh, for their scandalous private lives. I mean, it doesn't reach, she didn't reach, you know, Paris Hilton extremes, more, more talented than Paris Hilton, I'm willing to concede, uh, and more than Lindsay Lohan. But I do think this was a period when studios were ceasing to successfully control access to the private lives of stars because the studio system was breaking down. And, and I guess already new technologies were making things transparent. But... She was one of the first people with a very widely known, uh, you know, spicy private life. Because it took the form of, of, of a divorce every two or three weeks, you know, and, and you know stealing what? She somebody didn't, else's And husband. she didn't really suffer from it. Maybe uh, we're stumbling on a theory here that's the first sort of example of Hollywood slut shaming that didn't work. You know, people <laughs> like just shrugged it off. Like, hey, look, you know, she's... Uh, She's uh, she's leading, leading an interesting life, and she's more uh, more interesting than your average actress. De- defining defining deviants down is whose phrase? That's some famous person's yeah, phrase. Yeah. You know, the process of of you know the more public, formally scandalous things become, the less they're considered scandalous. <clears throat> um, so what so you're saying I, is that she paved the way to a new Gingrich. This is, uh, this is where it all comes back around. I see it as an unbroken <laughs> success. Yes, a clear causal connection. Um, and, and, but I kind of think that if you look at all these people who who uh, who were who were paying these lavish uh, you know doing these lavish eulogies on on media, a lot of them were just of a certain age where they had come of an age where she was the thing to fall in love with. Um, again, you know, look, pretty talented, pretty you know, totally entitled to be an actress. I just thought it was kind of overdone. So who is going to be uh, then uh, your actress? Who you came of age well, to fall in love with? Well, an example of that. My coming of age actress is like you know Catherine Ross. You know, like just because I'm an adolescent and I see you know Butch Cassidy and then and then and then later go back and see The Graduate, which actually came out when I was a, a, probably pre-adolescent. Uh, and you know, it's just because of the age I'm at that I, that I think she's the most beautiful woman in the world, which she you know is actually not. Uh, no, because Alan Sheedy is right. <laughs> Uh, Ali She. I didn't even have a clear conception of Ali She. Oh, oh, Ali. She- oh, no, no, no. War Games. Who is Ali? Oh, War Games. Boy, that's a long time yeah. ago. Matthew Broderick. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, that's your. That's your. I was. I was post adolescent by then. That, so, so that's yours, Ali She. Well, probably. Although you know, her post nineteen eighty six career kind of uh, takes the bloom off that rose, but uh, of that kind of crucial. Uh, teenage hood years. Uh, she uh, she had my heart there. I actually, I actually always liked Faye Dunaway as a uh, a, oh, a yeah. bar fly. Well, that was yeah yeah. You know I like yeah, I was, alcoholic I was, uh, lady Bonnie, with a great dance. Uh, she was uh, she was good for me. Bonnie and Clyde kind of sold me on her for sure. The uh, but at your age, I would think Sigourney Weaver was another. Oh, uh, 
thousand times no. No. no uh, she's no. Uh, just. She's controversial. She's just a little bit uh, older than I am, and so was already like a. Uh, Kicking ass with a gun uh, more than enticing us with her. Uh, no, but wait, wait, no, the year of living dangerously probably comes out during your teens. Doesn't this is it? true. This is true. I just uh, you know, c- certain movies touch you in different places. Shall we say? Well, at that point, we definitely have to take it offline now, because <laughs> this is this is not that kind of show, and I hope you're not touching those places. And so, and I'm, I'm personally. Gonna stop right now, but thank you, thank you for being with us during the family portion of the show, Matt. I, I enjoyed this a lot. Thanks very much. I will stop right now. All right. See ya.